around uh, three seating areas. Okay, so our uh, fourth speaker today is um, Dr. Gary Klein. Uh, Dr. Klein received his PhD in experimental psychology from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he was assistant professor of psychology at Oakland University and then a research scientist, uh, psychologist for the U.S. Air Force. In 1978, he find, founded his own company, Klein Associates. Uh, Dr. Klein developed the recogni recognition prime decision uh, model, formulated models of sense making, of planning to handle wiki problems, and of insight. He's been instrumental in founding the field of naturalistic decision making. Uh, Dr. Klein has written a number of books, such as Sources of Power, How People Make Decisions, The Power of Intuition, Searching for the Keys to Adaptive Decision Making, and most recently, Remarkable Ways We Gain Insights. Uh, Dr. Klein is presently Senior Scientist at Macrocognition. LEC. Dr. Klein, the floor is yours. Thank you. So Chris and Jatu, thank you very much for inviting me. I appreciate it. Um, I enjoyed the, the sessions this morning. I hope I can provide some useful information. Each of the speakers this morning talked about decision making. They talked about the human element. They talked about cognition. And so that's the topic of um, my presentation is to um, sort of take stock of what, if anything, have we learned about decision-making and cognition in the past 20 years? Are we still where we were then, or have we made any progress? And I'm, I'm going to frame this inquiry using a, um, a simple, uh, typical kind of exercise. Imagine a British soldier on a mission uh, to the north gets somehow stranded in Greenland, encased in a block of ice, this is 1995, and just gets discovered, thought out, and amazingly because of resilience, uh, is, is, is in perfect shape. Heart is fine, all the vital functions are fine, brain seems fine, but they want to test them on various ways, and so we're able to smuggle in uh, a test of certain beliefs to see uh, what, how he would uh, line up with these. And these are the beliefs that I want to examine. There's 10 of them. And I think in 1995, all of these would have seemed to be reasonable beliefs. I think most people would have signed up for each one of those. Um, to make a decision, you generate several options and compare them to pick the best one. Obviously, how else would you do it? Um, you build expertise by teaching the rules and procedures. Yes, that's the standard systematic way. You want to reduce uncertainty, you gather more information, of course. Deep down, people from other cultures are just like us, obviously. You improve performance by teaching critical thinking and other methods because you want to reduce errors, clearly. Insights. Insights arise when people have been stuck in some mental set and they overcome it, and that's where the insights come from. Uh, you train decision-making by... Uh, uh, taking a standard process like the military decision-making procedure in the United States and teaching something like that. It's tried and true, tested and accepted. Workload gets too high, what do you do? You add more people to the team. How else could you, should you proceed? Organizations are always interested in promoting innovation and promoting insights. Clearly, that they'll all tell you that and they, they're all uh, fervent about trying to increase innovations. And don't start a project unless you have a clear description of the goal. Otherwise, you can wind up anywhere. These all make sense. They made sense in 1995. And I'm going to try to explain the progress we've made by showing you what's wrong with each one of these statements. And we have learned in the last 20 years, some of them are just, just incomplete. They're, they're not totally wrong. They, they just tell a part of the story. Others are more misleading, and some of them are just flat out wrong. And I'm going to explain what's, what's the problem with each one of these statements as a way of documenting what we have learned in the last 20 years. And the way we've learned it, most, most of it, is by adopting a paradigm called naturalistic decision making. And the idea of naturalistic decision making is to study how people think, make sense of events, make decisions, in real situations. And this is different from what had preceded and what's still going on to a large extent, which is using laboratory studies. And laboratory studies are designed to be able to run crisp controls, clear uh, conditions and manipulations, so you can draw firm conclusions. 
And this, that's fine. That's the way uh, science is supposed to operate. But that's not the only way science is supposed to operate. Because people we're interested in are making decisions not in laboratories, but in complex situations. And Dave Woods will be talking about complexity. And so there are situations where the goals aren't clear. You're not sure what counts as a right answer. Where there's lots of organizational constraints and interactions. And all of these kinds of factors that are high stakes, you can't have high stakes in a laboratory, and yet we're asking our warfighters to make tough decisions involving high stakes. That's their job. And so how do they do it? How do they do it under uncertainty and time pressure? According to the standard views 20 years ago, it should have been impossible. And yet we know that it can be done. So how could it be done? And the most important, one of the most important of these factors is experience. Because laboratory studies uh, give, um, usually college students, give them novel tasks. Because you don't want people who have lots of experience because that contaminates the results. What if you get too many experienced people in one of your groups and not the others, and all of a sudden your error variance uh, goes up? And so you want to control experience. And the easiest way to control experience is to give people tasks they've never seen before, so the experience level is zero. And I once talked to a, a researcher, and he said, no, 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 I train my subjects. I give them lots of training. I said, how much training? Because I just finished a study of firefighters. And, I, and they had 15, 20 years of experience. And I said, how much training do you give them? And he said, oh, we give them 10 hours of practice. And I'm thinking, 10 hours, 20 years, we're not even talking about the same thing. And so we've learned a lot because we've looked at cognition, decision-making, other cognitive functions outside of sterile conditions and in messy conditions. So let's get on with, with the, the, the 10 items that I want to uh, describe. The first one, the simplest one, to make a decision, generate several options, compare them to pick the best one. All right, that's this kind of a diagram, uh, multi-attribute utility analysis. Seems like a great idea, seems like a reasonable idea. When's the last time you used something like this to make a decision? Some people will say maybe a week ago, a month ago, some people can't remember ever setting up this kind of a matrix where you have your options and you have your dimensions and you add them at the end. And if somebody forces you to make a decision like this, you know what you would do. If this comes out and, wow, it's option A, that's the best one. But in your heart, you really want option C. Do you say, I'm going to pick option A? Or do you say... I'm not so sure about evaluation dimension one. I think that was a mistake. And I think, I think evaluation dimension two and four should get much more credit, maybe double the amount of, of value that I've given them. And you fidget until it comes out the way you want, and then you show them, look, I've made a rational decision. And they say, good job. You, you, uh, you, you're somebody we can rely on. And you smile because you've got what you want. And so people game the system. There's no evidence that following this actually pr improves performance. There's only one study I know that required people to use this versus their own uh, intuitive judgment, and they did get a significant difference. The people who used this scheme were significantly worse than the people who did not. So what's happening if you don't follow a scheme? How can people make decisions without comparing options? It should be impossible. We studied firefighters, and we uh, found out that there were two mysteries we had to resolve. First of all, um, how do you come up, the, the firefighters, we asked them, how do you compare options when you have to make a decision? They said, we never compare options. We said, what? And they said, no, you just look at a fire, and, and, and basically it's just procedures. And we just got, we had just gotten funded from the Army, the US Army, to study decision making using firefighters. And this guy, he's the first one I ever interviewed, and he said, it's just procedures. And I thought, ah, oh, we've just blown up our, our, a project. This is where we're, before we even get out of the starting blocks, we're finished. So I said, okay, just as procedures? He said, sure, that's all it is. And I said, okay, before I leave, um, can I see the procedure manual? And he said, oh, it's not written down. <laughs> you just know. 
And I said, okay, so let's see what they're doing. And what they're doing is basically a combination of two things. Um, first part is uh, pattern matching. Over the course of 15, 20 years, uh, commanders uh, build up patterns. They've seen so many different things. And the patterns tell them what to pay attention to, the cues that they can notice and what they can ignore so they're not in attention o uh, overload. It tells them uh, what they can expect so their behavior is smooth. They do something and they know what to get ready to do next. And if their expectation is violated, it tells them maybe they sized up the situation wrong. It tells them what are the plausible goals so they know what they can achieve and what they need to back off on. And it tells them the kinds of actions that they should consider. And so when they see a situation, they look at a few different patterns and then one of them matches and this could happen within seconds. That's how people make life and death decisions under extreme time pressure. They say, that's what I think is going on. And so now they've sized it up. And, and they, they think they know how to proceed. But that's only part of it. And it's mysterious because pattern matching isn't something that we're aware of. So this is, feels, this, this is intuition. But intuition isn't the whole story because you still have to evaluate it. So how do you evaluate an option without comparing it to another option? And we went back and we looked at our transcripts because we interviewed uh, a, a few dozen firefighters, highly skilled firefighters. And the way they evaluated it was they imagined it. We called it mental simulation. They just imagined it. If I do this action, what's likely to happen? And they played it out in their mind. And if they liked the result, then they did it and they were set. If they almost liked the result, they could fiddle with it to come up with a better option. And if they couldn't find a way to fiddle with it to make it work, they said, forget about that. What's the next one in my queue? And they kept going down until they could find one that worked. So this has been replicated a number of times. Uh, and this seems to be how people make decisions, not just life and death decisions, but certainly ordinary decisions 90, 95% of the time. There are times when we have to compare options, but we don't use the matrix I showed you before. There's other strategies for that. So that's what's wrong with the first belief. Um, so what do you do with this? To our surprise, about 10, 15 years after we published the research, we found out that the Army was including this in their uh, field manual. The US Army included it in their field manual 6.0, Command and Control to include not just uh, analytic decision-making, but recognitional decision-making. So this had become part of Army doctrine. Next issue is how do you put it into practice? So we were part of a Marine observation, US Marines, at 29 Palms, uh, with working with uh, one MEF. We were there for a week. At the end of the week, we were asked to brief the uh, Lieutenant General Fulford about our results. So we described what we had seen, what we found, and uh, he agreed with everything except one conclusion. We said, you've got a, a, a Marine Corps planning process, MCPP, that you teach the Marines, this is how to plan, this is how to uh, proceed. No, nope, we never saw anybody use it. You're teaching people some, uh, 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 an approach that nobody's ever using. So you need to rethink whether you want to teach it. And he said, I'm not on board with that. I'll tell you why. Because we have to have some approach, otherwise it's chaos. So I'd rather teach the wrong approach than none at all. <laughs> we thought that was almost reasonable, but that you could do better than that. And so my, my colleague, John Schmidt, who uh, is a former Marine, came up with a recognition of planning model based on the work that we had done on decision making. And the idea there is rather than having a commander give a task off to the staff and then have them come back and brief and chew up hours like that, the commander almost immediately knows what he wants to do. So why not start with that rather than have the staff guess at it? So the, uh, the guidance comes in, and it's the commander, in, uh, the, the, the thing in yellow, identifies the mission, and he conceptualizes the course of action, and he tells them about it. And then... He turns it over to them, and they operationalize it because they may find flaws with it, or they may find improvements. It's not the, the, the last word, but at least they're starting from a good starting point. And then he comes back, and they wargame it. And all along, they're developing an op order because the odds are that his, his identification of the mission is going to work. And this is a way of rapidly speeding up the planning 
and having a very natural situation. This model is what we saw uh, a colonel, a, a brigade colonel we observed, uh, Stan McChrystal. We watched him in an exercise. He got a, a new mission. He was issuing an order, his mission order, five minutes later. That's all the time he needed. We had a, 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 a watch on him. That's all the time he needed. So then the Army asked us if we would teach this and try it out at Fort Leavenworth at the Battle Command Battle Lab. So we went in there to, to do a tryout. And um, there were a bunch of retired Army colonels who didn't think much of, of it or of us. They didn't think much of me, obviously, because I have no military background. But John Schmidt, being a former Marine, they thought even less of him. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot of contempt there. So we tried it out, and it was working beautifully. And then midway through the week, we asked, uh, we, we sort of had a hot wash, and we said, what do you guys think? And they, they, one of them said, you think you're so smart with this new recognitional planning model. There's nothing new here. This is the way we always do it. And he meant it as a criticism. For me, that was a compliment. That's what we were trying to do, come up with doctrine that match what people really do rather than some artificial doctrine that people don't follow and, actually, and, and gets in the way. All right, next issue. Build expertise by teaching rules and procedures. That's fine if expertise depends on rules and procedures, but it doesn't. If you think about the kinds of knowledge that experts have, procedures work in well-ordered situations, but they break down in, and they become brittle in complex situations. They're not sensitive to tacit knowledge. What do I mean by tacit knowledge? I mean all the stuff below the waterline. I mean being able to recognize patterns. I mean being able to make discriminations, coming up with developing sophisticated mental models. We don't even know what our mental models consist of a lot of it is tacit knowledge about how things work and how they're connected, and a set of those beliefs, and they govern the way we act and the way we plan and the way we make decisions. Uh, judging typicality. You need to know what's typical, which you build up only through experience in order to detect an anomaly, in order to say, this doesn't seem right. I better become curious. I better investigate it further. So tacit knowledge is where the expertise really exists, but because it's hard to articulate because it's tacit, so it gets ignored and people just automatically start to teach rules and procedures and miss the tacit knowledge dimension. I'll tell you a story about that. We were developing methods for, no for knowledge capture, and I was out in San Diego, and this was a Navy project. And um, my, my sponsor, Josephine Randall, had a, a brought in a friend of hers, uh, an electronic warfare coordinator, and he had been just come off from sea, six months at sea, now he was teaching, and I had him for two hours to interview him. And so I was trying out the methods, and I was saying, how would you know this? Give me an example. Why, why would you do that? And we had two hours that I really enjoyed, and I kept pumping him. What I didn't know is he was hating it. He hated every minute of it. He expected he was going to go there and just give his standard speeches about how the job is done, and I kept pushing him and he found it very uncomfortable. He was angry at me, he was angry at Josephine, and he walked out and he was steaming. But I, I, didn't, I didn't see, he was very polite, I didn't see how angry he was. And what he told us later, it was two days later, um, he was teaching his next class, and he got up to teach the class. And as he told it, what he said to us was, I heard myself explaining things that I never explained before. When the class was over, he came back to Josephine and he said, something happened to me in that interview, I don't know what it is, and I want to be part of the project. And he became part of our project because we had sensitized him to the tacit knowledge that made him so skilled rather than the procedures he had been teaching. Okay, next issue, reduce uncertainty by gathering more information. All right, that seems reasonable. Of course, that's what you would do. There's some research that suggests it works up to a point, but then the additional information actually reduces performance, <laughs> that you start saturating with the information. It, it, it's not helping you. It's getting in your way. Why would that be? A number of researchers have different kinds of speculations. One is overconfidence. The more data you have, wow, I have all these data, so I must really know it. 
And so you, you have too much confidence just because you have additional data, even if the data aren't really helping you. Or there's a reduced marginal value. Uh, the additional data, every new piece of data has a smaller and smaller amount of marginal value, but adds more difficulty in, to integrate it with everything else, and so the additional information can, can sometimes get in your way. Or prioritizing. Uh, Mary Omidai did a study where she presented firefighters with lots of information or not, and when she gave them too much information... They were spending all their time saying, should I read this? Should I read this message? Should I look at this? And they weren't spending as much time on integrating it. So all their time was spent on managing the information and less time on figuring out what, making sense of the information to try to sort it out and see what was going on. So they had a worse picture than the people who had less information. She also gave them uh, clues about which information was more or less reliable. The group that was told that the information was, was, was uh, less uh, trustworthy and le less reliable did better because they scrutinized everything. But if the group that was told this is all reliable, they just sort of took it all for granted and became less critical and less curious and less questioning. So that's what's wrong with the third belief. Um, I should say a few words about big data because that gets mentioned a lot. And big data obviously provides opportunities and command and control. It's important. But there's an assumption that more data and more data crunching is going to give us better performance. Uh, and my point here is that data analysis is not an end in itself. The point is to use the data to generate insights, not to crunch the data as powerfully as you can to get the most out of it. And insights come from, often come from giving up some cherished beliefs. And that's not just the accumulation of data. You sometimes see a diagram, you go from data to knowledge to information to understanding. It seems like a nice conveyor belt, but it doesn't just work that way. For an insight, you often have to say, no, this knowledge is something that doesn't quite work here. It's not relevant, or I don't trust it, or I think it was gathered in, in, in a faulty way, or what I'm calling data really aren't the right kinds of data, and I have to re-examine what I'm defining as data. We design databases, and then the data crunching goes on. The problem is with insights, the databases we design at the outset are going to become obsolete. And so to, to, to use them at the outset at, at, uh, to, to drive all the activities isn't going to get you very far if, if the, the whole point of the exercise is to come up with better concepts for how to do the representation. The same thing for the way you, we do our coding. How many times have people done studies and a third of the way through the study, they say, oh, I've got to change my coding scheme. I, I've got these categories, I've got this, I've wasted my time. You haven't wasted your time. You've learned a more sophisticated mental model, and so you've made a change ret rather than just uh, continuing to, uh, to, to code data. Big data allow us to, to generate trends. It seems like a wonderful idea, except what happens in a, in a complex world when trends change, when new conditions arise that render old trends obsolete, then we can become trapped. And so I, I think there, there are some reasons not to be totally enthusiastic about big data if, if it crowds out our own judgment and our own decision-making and our own sense-making. Next topic. Deep down, people from other cultures are just like us. This may not be a problem in the UK because of your sophistication and the way that you're embedded in lots of different cultures. It's a problem in the United States where we have so many people who uh, go into the military and they've never been more than 20 miles from the farming community where they grew up. And so for them, a foreign experience would be going to the next county. You know, they may never have been there. And, and people do different things there. And so, you know, taking them to a, a different country is, is, is really very difficult. And so, we want to give them the, the, the heuristic. Deep down, they're just like us. That's wrong. They're not just like us. And uh, they, they differ in some fundamental ways. And here I'm drawing on the work of, 
of, of Helen Klein and her work on a cultural lens model. And, and she's developing something, a, a generic tool, a cultural passport, to help people regardless of what culture you're in. See, the, the problem with trying to come up with tools for entering different cultures is it's a fool's errand. It's a never-ending game. You say, okay, I have a tool that's going to allow me to take an American soldier and go into Afghanistan. Okay, now I have an, Af an, an Afghan culture. And they say, which part of Afghanistan? And what language do they speak? And you say, okay, we're going to go northern Afghanistan. That, that's our area. Okay, great. Um, which tribe? And then which, which village? And, and possibly even which neighborhood in which? I mean, it never ends. And so rather than trying to, uh, to, to find the right target, by the time we figure it out, we're usually not there anymore. Uh, is to come up with some generic uh, differences, cognitive and social differences, and say, we don't know which ones may be relevant. Your job is to apply this passport and see which ones come up, which ones seem relevant. Your job is to go in, not as a, a person who can follow procedures, but as an explorer, as an investigator, to see how this works and how they think in ways that are different from us. Okay, next one. Teach critical thinking. Uh, who can resist critical thinking? Identify all your assumptions, only make logical decisions. This makes total sense, and especially when it gets combined with the work of heuristics, heuristics and biases work of Kahneman and Tversky in behavioral economics. And you have all these books that are uh, bestsellers, Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely, Blind Spots, Everyday Irrationality, Kahneman's thinking fast and slow. These are smart people, and they really write. Uh, th their books are very convincing and very easy to read, and I don't have any objection to what they write, but it's just a part of the story. The part that makes me nervous is I think they've overstated the, pro the, the worries about decision biases. They've made us almost phobic about drawing our own conclusions without having a decision researcher at our elbow to make sure that we haven't committed any of these biases because the biases are so rampant. And their standard is Bayesian statistics. But Bayesian statistics, although they're marvelously powerful and sometimes have really powerful applications, and they're also brittle. They're also, they don't generalize well to natural settings. And so the, the notion is we want to de-bias people, which I think is an absolutely terrible idea because biases are essentially the way we use heuristics. And if you get rid of our biases, you're going to get rid of our heuristics and you're going to render us uh, incapable of handling high-paced kinds of situations. The researchers look at the downside of, of the heuristics. They have never doc tried to document what's the upside of the heuristics. Why do we use them? Why have we developed them? Why can we apply them? And so those are my concerns. Um, if you think about ways of improving performance, I sort of like this diagram. Uh, and there's just two things that, that we can do. There's a down arrow. We want to reduce errors, right? That's one thing we want to do to, to reduce performance, to improve performance. The other thing we want to do is increase insights and discoveries. And it's not one or the other. We want to do both. We, want to, we don't want to increase discoveries, even if it means lots and lots of errors, because too many people are in situations where errors can be fatal. So I'm not saying ignore the errors. What I am saying is we find that people go to excess in trying to reduce errors, and it gets in the way of insights and creativity. So you don't want to go home at the end of the day having been consumed by critical thinking activities. And somebody says, what did you do today? And you say, this was a great day. I didn't make any mistakes. I don't think that's going to make, that's, that's going to make you feel all that productive or valuable if the best you can do is not make mistakes. I think you want to make contributions. I think you want to make discoveries. And I think you want to do both of those. And so the, the work on heuristics and biases and deep biasing, it's just about the down arrow. It's ways of trying to cut down errors. You can think about it, and I'm, I'm borrowing from, from your talk about the importance of winning. Focusing on the down arrow is essentially playing not to lose. 
adding in the up arrow about making discoveries and coming up with insights is playing to win. It's playing to come up with new ideas and new and more effective ways of doing things. Okay, that brings us to the topic of insights. Insights arise when you're trying a task and you have some mental set and it blocks you and you're stuck and then eventually you think of a way around it. And this, you know, there's been lots of research, uh, laboratory research on this, the nine dot problem, all kinds of laboratory problems. This isn't wrong. And this was sort of originated by Graham Wallace in his book, uh, The Art of Thought in 1926. Problem with it is it's only part of the story. Just finished a study of insights without any preconceived notions. I just wanted to see what kind of examples I could come up with in the literature, in, 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 in books and, and, and articles and, and reviews and, and see if I could sort it out. And some of them were like this, but some of them weren't. A lot of them, so this is what I would call the creative desperation path, where you're stuck you know, there should be a way to solve this problem. What am I not seeing? And then eventually you realize that you've got a weak anchor, a weak belief that's getting in your way, and you can get rid of it. But there's other ways of coming up with insights. The middle way seems to be the most prevalent is the connection path. You put different ideas together, and you come up with something new that you didn't have before. And so uh, Martin Chalfie, a physiologist at Columbia, studying worms, he was a physiologist, and he would chop them up to see uh, what happened as a result of his manipulation. They were translucent worms, but that's just irrelevant to him. And he goes to a lunchtime talk, and the speaker in the, is sort of going on, and Trophy is just there to be a good citizen, and the speaker says, and by the way, this Japanese researcher, you see there, there, there are certain kinds of jellyfish that if you shine light on them, they glow green. And a Japanese researcher has just synthesized this green fluorescent protein and knows the DNA. And everybody else in the, in the room is sort of listening. And Shofi says, this is a protein. We know the DNA. If you shine light on it, it glows green. And I'm studying worms that are translucent. I can get this protein inside my worm, and I can study them while they're alive. I don't have to chop them up anymore and he won a Nobel Prize for that. So it wasn't that, that Trophy was trying to solve this problem. He wasn't even aware that it was a problem or it was an issue. And he wasn't looking to solve anything. There was no period of incubation. He just saw the things, and he put them together. And so this connection path is not the same as this creative desperation path. Then there's a third path, which we call the contradiction path. So this police officer who tells me about it, he's riding in a squad car, and he's got a, a young officer with me. He's very, uh, he was happy to tell me the story. And they're stuck in traffic, and there's a stop, there, there's a light, they're waiting. The car in front of him is a new BMW. And the young officer is looking at the car, and he says, look at that. The, guy, the driver of the BMW was smoking a cigarette. Takes a, a, a drag on the cigarette, then he flicks his ashes. And the officer said, who flicks his ashes in a new BMW? If you owned a BMW, would you be flicking your ashes like that? If you borrowed it from a friend, this doesn't feel right. And they pull him over. Sure enough, it was a stolen car. OK, so there was a contradiction. He saw something that didn't fit with the rest of the picture. So the connection path is about making connections. The contradiction path is about seeing that certain things can't be connected, seeing disconnections. So these seem to be three different paths for making insight, and rather than tunneling in just on the creative desperation path. All right. Um, standardizing procedures like military decision-making process, and I, I showed you the recognition of planning model that we have as a replacement for that. What's wrong with this? And what can you do instead? How can you train instead? There's a technique I heard about from a friend of mine, Neil Heinz, who was a battalion chief with the New York Fire Department. And he demonstrated it. And we're calling it a shadow box technique. And the idea of this is to not train in procedures, but to train tacit knowledge. 
and the way Neil does it, and the way we, we've been experimenting with, the, the problem was, if you want to have a training program, you usually bring in subject matter experts. There aren't that many subject matter experts. They're not that available. They're hard to find. They're expensive. So they're a bottleneck. And so the method is, you show people a complex situation. It's a scenario-based approach that Neil uses. And then you, in the middle, you interrupt it and you say, here's some choices. You can take one of these actions, you know, four different possibilities. Or here's some priorities, some goals, three different goals, rank, uh, rank them, which you prefer, which you don't. Or here are cues you can monitor, rank those. There's five different cues, which one would you monitor most closely? And then you write down your rationale, why you ranked it that way, all right? Then in advance, you've had a panel of experts go through the same scenarios, do the same exercise, and so after I've ranked them and written my rationale, then I get to see what did the experts rank? Because I'm dying to know, did they rank it like me? And usually they don't. And so that's a wake-up call. Maybe I'm not as good as I thought. And then I look at the rationale. What were they noticing that I hadn't seen? And that's my opportunity to start to see the world through the eyes of experts. But the experts aren't there. All, we have their material, but we don't have to have the experts in the room. And then the last step is um, what I have to write down what the difference is. So I have to articulate it and, and sensitize myself. What were the experts noticing and thinking about and responding to that I hadn't written down in my rationale? Of course, that tells me where I have to stretch. So we've explored Neil's uh, uh, approach. He got 18% improvement with a half a day of training. We've gotten even higher levels of improvement. So this is a way of training that's not procedural, that's oriented towards tacit knowledge. When workload gets too high, add more people to the team. Of course, that's what you would do. Unless you have read Frederick Brooks's wonderful book, The Mythical Man Month, that says when the workload is too high, that's the worst time to add more people to the team because now you have to train them as well as do your job, so you're cutting your own throat. So my uh, uh, friend David Klinger, friend and colleague David Klinger, did a project with the nuclear power plant. After Three Mile Island, the nuclear industry learned a certain lesson. They learned that it's not a good idea to have your control room located in the nuclear power plant because if the nuclear power plant is melting down, it's probably not doing good things to your decision makers. And it might be a good idea to locate them dozens of miles away. But now they're not in the plant anymore, so you have a coordination problem. And so this one uh, organization, this one uh, company, they were a good company, but they, they kept failing their, their, their tests from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And so they didn't know what to do. They had a large room, and they had 80 to 100 people stuffed in this room, and they were still overloaded. The workload was too high. So they would have added more people if they could have fit them in the room, if they could have had like poles and sort of shoved them in the room, but they were at the limit, so they didn't know what to do. So they were desperate enough to bring in some outsiders. And so Klinger came in with his team to see what was going on. And they thought he was going to tell them, you need more people. He didn't. He gave them a number of recommendations. And the most important one was cut the size of the staff from 80, maybe 100, down to 35. They did better with 35 than they did with 80. All of a sudden, they became a successful team. They were not frenetic. They were not frantic. The head of the, uh, of the power plant came by during one of the exercises, and he said, what's going wrong? Why, why did you stop the exercise? But nobody knew that the exercise was stopped. And the reason was it hadn't been stopped. He had never seen them working so quietly before. So he assumed that there was a, a, a pause in the exercise. So what's going on here? What's going on is two different factors, at least. One of them is, if, if I'm doing the whole job by myself, that's overloading. If I add you, that's great. Thanks a lot. If I add Simon, that's wonderful. Not as helpful as you because now I'm adding it. It's the marginal utility of each new person I add goes down. By the time I've added Paul, you know, if you're number 10, you're not adding that much. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to have you, but, but it, it's not adding that much because the marginal utility goes down. But the coordination costs keep going up. And at a certain point, the coordination cost is greater than the marginal utility. And now each person you add subtracts rather than adds. 
and the workload is going up. And what do we know to do when workload goes up? We add more people. And so we get ourselves stuck in the wrong place. And so that's what's wrong with that belief. Organizations promote innovation by encouraging insights. They believe that, and they want their workers to believe it. And, and, and they're being sincere. Uh, they're just deluding themselves because organizations don't want insights and aren't comfortable with innovation. And uh, last night, we had an interesting discussion about one of the reasons why organizations get in their own way, which is if, if you're the head of the organization and you have a great idea, do you implement it? You give it to your subordinate, who's not quite sure what you want. So he or she gives it to, to, the, to, that, to their subordinate. It goes down two or three levels, and it's finally being implemented by somebody who doesn't know what's involved and what's, what's it, why this is being done and it becomes a failure. So this is, you know, even if people have the best of intentions, it's, it's a problem, but they usually don't have the best of intentions. Um, back to this diagram. Organizations are captured by the down arrow. If you're a manager in an organization, people know when you've made a mistake. It's visible, and you could be blamed. They don't know what to do with the up arrow. If you ask an organization, what are you doing about, uh, about promoting insights? Either they'll give you a blank look or they'll say, we hang inspirational posters on the wall. And so that, that's, that, that's their big uh, drive to, to make people more creative. Um, problem with insights is that they're disorganizing. They make the job of managers more difficult. They're disruptive, and so they're, they're problematic for organizations. Uh, we don't trust creativity. So if somebody says, I've got a new idea, Mueller and, 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 and colleagues did a study. As soon as you say that, people are already starting to become suspicious because new ideas are sketchy. They could be problematic. They could be filled with errors. You've got to be careful. Predictability. If you want me to be a good manager, I can do it by having a very predictable function. I want to make sure everything follows nicely. Insights come without warning and take the forms that I never expected. That's the opposite of predictable. That makes my job as a manager so much more, more tr problematic. Perfection, I want to reduce errors. If I miss an insight, nobody will know. If I make an error, everybody will know. If my team makes an error, everybody will know. So I don't want to run those kinds of risks. Effort, there's more work, and so I, I, uh, I don't want to gravitate towards that. Goal fixation. When facing a wicked problem, Sengupta and all did, did a study, and they found that managers, this was in a simulation, and managers working in, in, in that environment were given a task, and then the task became obsolete. The goals became obsolete. Did the managers change their goals? No, they held on to their goals because they had been promoted because the company could trust them to, to persist and to be conscientious and pursue the original goals, and so they hung on to them, even when the goals became obsolete. And that brings us to the last one. Don't start projects without a clear description of the goal. Have you ever heard of that? I mean, has anybody ever given you that advice? If you don't have a clear description at the outset, you don't know where you're going to wind up. That makes sense if you're working with well-defined goals. And you may, people may be at the beginning of their career, but as they become, as they move up a hierarchy and are given more responsibility, they're not just dealing with well-defined goals. They start dealing with wicked problems. And wicked problems aren't true or false. There's no right or wrong answer. And in fact, our original idea of, uh, of what the goals are, if it's a wicked problem, the only way we're likely to solve it is to change the goal, is to learn as we try to wrestle with the goal at the outset and see what's wrong with that goal so we can replace it with a better goal. And so if you're dealing with wicked problems, you don't want to lock into that original goal. You want an organization that will be sensitive to uh, things that they learn as they pursue the goal so that they can make modifications on the fly and, that, and, and they, they can put that learning to, uh, to good use. And so um, the idea is not management by objectives where you freeze the objectives, but management by discovery where you discover what the objectives can be and ought to be. And we're not talking about generating a new schedule. That's what happens if you run into trouble. 
let's just change the schedule, but hold on to the goals, or change the tasks, or change the plan. And we're not talking about what the military concept is, that you know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. That means I'm going to hold on to my goals, but I'm going to change the plan. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about changing the goals themselves, based on how you read the situation, saying, this goal isn't going to apply. Here's why. Here's what I can do that's productive instead, and using uh, initiative in order to make those kinds of decisions. So challenges that I see relating to cognition. Answer the question, have we learned anything in the last 20 years? I think we've learned a tremendous amount. I think because of the work in naturalistic decision making that a number of pioneers like David Woods and others have uh, uh, engaged in, we have a much better sense of the human part of, of the equation. I think we may now be in a position to develop warfighters who are truly adaptive, who can develop richer mental models rather than just internalized rules and procedures. They can become less fragile and more agile. Uh, they can, that diagram, they can balance the need to reduce errors with a desire to increase insights and discoveries. Uh, using cognitive systems engineering and resilience engineering, I think it's possible to design IT systems that can support the way people actually think, not the way that they're supposed to think in some information processing concept of, of the way uh, of, of cognition. Better teamwork, I think so many command posts run into problems because they're overstaffed, not because they're understaffed. They're getting in, in their own way. And I think we, we can start to think of, uh, work on the issues of deceptive cyber adversaries and the, the, the inevitability of handling situations where we have compromised systems. Those are some of the challenges that I, I think we're, we're maybe better positioned to uh, approach than we would have been 20 years ago with our understanding of cognition at that time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gary. Uh, do we have any questions, please, for Gary? Come on, let me show John. Right, that's, that's the kind of question I've always dread. <coughs> so you're asking me to escape from my own mental models, which we know in, in a, a Popperian sense obviously aren't true, and, and escape from that. And um, uh, I think I'm the wrong one to ask, but I can... I, I can Give you emails uh, for plenty to, uh, for the uh, plenty of my critics who would love to take a shot at that. <laughs> um, but you know, let, let me try to be more serious about that. What do I think the weaknesses of naturalistic decision making would be? Um, some people in the, in the academic community would say that the weakness is we're not collecting data carefully enough, and so we need to come up with methods of cognitive task analysis that would be more rigorous and more reliable and, 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 and more repeatable. And so that, that often gets suggested. I hate that idea. I think that's a wrong idea. Because the point of cognitive task analysis, which is kinds of interviewing, is not to be rigorous. It's to make discoveries. And so in terms of the down and the up arrow, I, I think that's the issue. I think um, the limitation would be and that, that diagram I showed you before about the little boat skirting and, and all the, the factors, those factors are individual factors, each on their own wave. You're going to hear the next talk from Dave Woods, who's going to discuss the importance of how those factors are interconnected. And that's something that, that I haven't addressed. You know, we've, we've looked at those factors, not in total isolation, but we haven't thought about, about what the connections would be in a, in, in a complex system. So that's probably going to be uh, the next breakthrough after naturalistic decision making. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Can uh, just wait to get the boom mic down, please. Can I take the uh, gentleman in the uniform? And I'll come to you, sir. So you've talked about the, um, the underpinning role of expertise 
in naturalistic decision making. What do we do when we get to environments where our expertise is no longer valid? Say again? Uh, what do we do when we get to an environment where expertise is no longer valid, but we just don't know? When we get to... Yeah, so we're operating in wicked and complex environments that we haven't had the opportunity to exist in and learn from. How does that, how does that first man in have the expertise to use the intuitive decision-making? Right, so this came up in the, in the, in the study I did of Insight. Because um, there's a belief that you need fresh eyes, that the, uh, in order to, uh, to to come up with new ideas, expertise can get in the way. And what we found was, in two thirds of our examples, you needed enough expertise that people who were totally uh, new to the area would not have come up with the insights. You need a certain amount of expertise. Um, the danger, and I haven't done the research on it, but I. I um, I'll, be just be, I'll just speculate here. The danger is that if I work in an area and I've been successful, I get more and more confident in my mental model and in the beliefs that I hold. And if you give me some disconfirming information, I become more skilled at explaining it away so I can hold on to flawed beliefs much longer. That's something we also noticed in our study of, of insight. Who got the insights and who didn't? And one of the barriers to insights was, having, was holding on to a flawed belief. Not having a flawed belief, but fixating on it. Like Watson and Crick, uh, discoverers of DNA. You know what their original model was, uh, was? It was called the triple helix. Okay, so they were wrong right out of the box. But they didn't get trapped by it, and other people did. So what do you do into a new situation and you're overconfident in your beliefs, that's sort of a recipe for disaster. What you want is somebody, and we heard discussions of this this morning, you want commanders who are very alert to anomalies. And because anomalies are the indicator that maybe I, ha I haven't figured it out right. And, 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 and I think General Free mentioned this about, uh, even when he was talking about big data, it wasn't that we want to get all the trends worked out. We want to have a system that will let us see the anomalies so that we, we, we can make the jump because otherwise we're going to be trapped in our beliefs. So I, I think that's what you would do is try to find ways to promote curiosity and openness to anomalies rather than letting people explain away inconvenient data. So the gentleman from here. Thank you for a, a very stimulating lecture. Um, the world has fallen in love with big data and machine learning in the expectation that it's going to improve our decision making. But almost none of these systems, maybe none, have any of the characteristics that you've described, the cognitive abilities. Do you like to comment on whether you think that's going to improve our decision making or not? I think it would be interesting to try to come up with, with architectures that um, are more compatible with the way people actually think, rather than architectures that are developed either in isolation of the way people think or um, uh, almost some of the systems just make it harder. And, and you say, why are you making me think like this? Why are you making me slave to the system? rather than have uh, at least an equal partnership, if not a supporting relationship. I'll give you an example. Um, if I'm driving someplace, I use a GPS, okay? And so I'm happy to use my little Google Maps on, on my iPhone, and it's telling me where to go. And especially if it's a new area, I trust it, but not 100%. And every now and then, the system will tell us, turn left, and we think it should turn right. True? And it doesn't make sense to us. And, and if you were driving next to me, if you were in, in, the, in the passenger seat, sorry, wrong side, if you were in the passenger seat with a map, I would turn to you and I'd say, left? And I don't even have to say, I mean, just my tone of voice is, is telling you, I don't believe left. And you would explain what your reason was. My GPS system doesn't allow me to have that conversation. My GPS system doesn't allow me 
to ask for a rationale and give me a simple rationale and also try to understand what might be confusing me so that it can give me a short answer rather than a long answer. So I'm stuck either trusting it, which I don't want to do, or pulling over to the side, which I don't want to do. It's not really a true partner. And so I'd like to see systems that, that, that uh, evolve that can be true partners and, 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 and work with me and, and not, make, not relegate me to somebody who feeds information in and, uh, and, and just depends and trusts the answer. Good time for one final question, if anybody has one. Can we get Steve there in the middle? Okay. So, Steve, will we get the mic to you? Hello. Uh, we live in an information age where um, technology potentially enables dispersed teams. Um, we heard General Capewell talk very eloquently this morning about the importance of uh, the human endeavour and face-to-face -face decision making. I was wondered what insights you could provide to us on decision making in dispersed teams and how we might be able to exploit the best of those two features. That's, that's, that's a personally relevant question because I just moved from Ohio to Washington, but my headquarters is still in Ohio, and so I'm trying to coordinate with them. And so uh, that, that's a, like a minuscule example of what has to be dealt with by the military all the time with dispersed teams and, and what could be done there. And so what's, what's the glue for, the, for, for, the, uh, for these kinds of coordination activities? And... This is going to sound trivial, but it's the best I can do in, in, in these circumstances. It's really trust. It's, it's, trust is the issue with me and my GPS. Trust is the issue with me with somebody that I've never met before. And do I trust them? And how can, how can they make themselves appear trustworthy? We hear this, uh, people who are on, on ships and, and, and they're just starting out and they ha the first time on, on the radio link. They know that they're going to be judged for the rest of their tour based on how they come, come across. And they're talking about credibility and they're talking about trust. We know that when you meet somebody, uh, you start talking about, uh, you haven't met them before, you talk about where are you from? Where have you worked? Do you know anybody in common? So you're trying to create some kind of networks and if they say, yeah, I know so-and-so, great fellow, and you think that the person is an idiot, okay? <laughs> That helps you calibrate whether to trust them. So I, 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 think, I think the issues are about how uh, can we assess trust quickly, whether the person is somebody new on our unit that, that just arrives, or somebody that we've never seen before. What, mobile, what modalities are we going to need in order to make a rapid and fairly accurate decision about whether they're credible and whether they're not? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so a round of applause for Gary there, I think. Uh, professor Woods is a professor in the Department of Integrated Systems Engineering at Ohio State University.